we'll move to the last uh, lecture of this session, and I'm uh, pleased to invite uh, Dr. Iftah Gefner, and uh, he will speak about safety assessment to a new vaccine moving forward to objective evaluation. Iftah. I hope it's gonna be a new cycle of science. Um, hi, I'm Iftar Gertner from the School of Public Health, Faculty of Medicine. I'm also a, a affiliated with Sylvan Adams Sport Institute. And I'm the only thing between you and lunch, so I hope I will make it uh, short. I'm gonna to talk today about the maybe new concept of shifting our assessment of safety in general clinical trials, but more specifically in vaccine studies to moving from objective, from subjective to obje objective evaluation. As we all know and been shown here today, in December 2020, the new uh, England Journal of Medicine come with a super novel study, very promising about uh, uh, the vaccine, the mRNA from, by Pfizer, and showing the 95% uh, efficacy. But if you look on the title, and also in the primary aim of the study, it was um, determined to test not only the efficacy, but as needed also the safety of this, of this uh, uh, vaccine. And when we talk in here today about the, the second dose that just uh, approved by the FDA earlier this week, if people are not gonna get vaccinated because of the concerns of the vaccine, the gap between the science of the how the immunity using the vaccine is become to be a big and much larger. And the question is, how do we determine the, the safety of the vaccine in, in 2022? That will be the focus of my topic. And in this study, and the later study came up, not only in the randomized clinical trial, but also in the population-based study, they determined the short-term, mild to moderate, pain or, or in the injection site, but only in the fatigue, the headaches, etc. I will go in more deeply later on. And they found pretty much this, it, it's safe. You, the the uh, side effects of the vaccine are similar to that uh, uh, other virtual vaccine, like the flu and others. And when we look more deeply uh, on the reported, and I mentioned the reported, uh, side effect of the vaccine, it was showing that both the local and the systemic adverse event uh, um, uh, were recorded either, um, as mentioned here, um, the pain in the injection site, the redness, the swelling, but also the systemic one. It was uh, um, short term, mild to moderate, and pretty much disappeared a few days after. But there were when we look at the reported percentage of the vaccine, for the first dose, it was around 90, but for the second dose, it was around 80. And we all know on ourselves, but also from the literature, that the second dose is the one that can be the more side effects. And the question is, the first question, it does 20% that did not uh, reported uh, symptoms, they're not reported at all. It doesn't mean if they, they had or not, it just, uh, not uh, uh, fill up the questionnaire, um, might be a bias. It might be not represent well the uh, uh, population in the randomized clinical trial. I'm not talking about the population-based study. And the way that it's been assessed in looking on the uh, supplementary file in, in the New England or, or the Pfizer uh, um, study, people have been asked to report side effect of the, of the vaccine by grading at four stages, either if the local or, or the systemic one, if it's a mild, moderate, severe, or have some adverse effect, but not only on, on, the, uh, um, on the systemic effect, but also the, the other uh, vitals that much easier to, to assess as the fever. And if I'll ask each one of you now, can you please raise your hand if you think you have a fever? How, how curated that will be if I will measure a temperature continuously? And in 2020 or in 2022, the clinical trial guidelines are still assessing the safety of the vaccine or in any other clinical trial permanently based on self-reported data, 
Maybe it's time to change the way we are assessing safety. About a decade ago, the FDA uh, established the Adverse Events Reporting System, which uh, uh, be required from the uh, pharmaceutical industry, healthcare providers, and, and other studies to report the fourth phase of the uh, vaccine or new treatment. The safety assessment, as I showed earlier, is just only for the uh, short phase. This last phase of clinical trials, the fourth, way, fourth phase, when uh, uh, those providers have been asked to report systematically. And when we look on the website from uh, uh, last night, there were uh, uh, several reports in the last three years, two and a half years, uh, to be more accurate. And there have been more than uh, 20,000 uh, um, severe reports with around uh, 2,000 deaths uh, following the vaccination within the four, within the uh, 14 days after or the long term. But despite the tremendous technology advantage in the last decade or so, including smart belt, a, a ring, watch, and any wearable we are using, I guess many of you, we are still using the old school reported questionnaire. At a single time point of the day, while you're awake, I asked you before, what is your fever right now? Can you tell me what is your fever during the night? I guess you cannot. And in, in, the, in the area of sports science where I'm coming from, we're using an objective scale to determine level of intense in exercise. For example, we're using the board scale, which is the most established one to rate a, a, in a, a, when you measure VO2 max or greater exercise test. And we're asking the, our subject to uh, rank the uh, uh, intensity of the exercise. But I cannot imagine using this scale as the only evaluation during my study. We have to measure uh, objective, continuous vitals in order to determine the physiology response of the exercise. So Coming with this idea of the sports science, uh, um, by coincidence or not, I, uh, uh, this study is in a collaboration with a, a brilliant group from the a Faculty of uh, Engineering, uh, Dr. Erez uh, Shmueli and Dan Yamin. And the aim of this study was to evaluate the short-term effect of the uh, uh, Pfizer vaccine using an objective and, con and continuously physiological indicator the way this study was a, a design is 24 hours pre-vaccination, uh, um, we measure the participants with the chest patch uh, uh, um, continuous uh, monitoring device, and we measure them uh, uh, four days, or th uh, more actually, uh, three days uh, uh, following the vaccine. So we have a, a baseline 24 hours before and three days after, and also we use the, a, a smart uh, uh, um, smartphones uh, to fill up electronic questionnaire. We'll go more deeply shortly. We recruit a large team of students from the med school um, to be able to conduct in study in, 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 in a rapidly uh, um, phase. We got an approved uh, for the IOB from the university. And this device, uh, the BioB device, the chest patch, will be able to determine uh, 13 vitals, th 13 uh, cardiorespiratory vitals, including a uh, heart rate, breathing rate, saturation, a uh, blood pressure, um, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see here, it's, by, it's approved by the, uh, cleared by the FDA for the uh, main vitals. The first one worldwide in an Israeli company. And this a patch was used in the, in the earlier study to determine the uh, um, cardiovascular changes in a COVID-19 patients where in, during the uh, hospitalization, we followed the main vitals, including uh, saturation, temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, et cetera. And we found a, a trajectory in, a, in, in those uh, parameters. But not only that, we'll be able to differentiate the physiological response of the disease between a, a male and female, BMI group, age group. So we'll be able to see maybe for the first time the continuous physiological response 
to the COVID-19 uh, infection. So this uh, other side of the, uh, this approach was to using the uh, uh, phone app, which was developed by uh, uh, the group of Daniel Min and uh, Erez Shmueli. They have a, a large uh, uh, ERC and a personal medicine ISF grant for that. So we combine our skills uh, and using uh, this side of this uh, uh, study. So participants will be able to monitor their daily a, a mood, how many hours they sleep at night, and also to, to report those symptoms uh, in more deeply, including uh, if they have a headache, if they have a, a, a soreness or, or redness in the uh, injection site. About the results, this study was published uh, uh, in a new uh, journal by Nature and Communication Medicine earlier this month. So we used 160 subjects that in the second dose. At the beginning, we had an idea to use the first and the second dose, and then we figure out it will be too complicated because the first do dose has, have no much uh, side effects. So we focus only on the second dose. Um, participants were uh, uh, relatively young with no uh, many comorbidities. That was part of the IRB, um, to not recruit uh, um, too old and uh, comorbidities uh, in the study. And it, to encourage the participants to uh, take part of the study, we also we provide a personal report with uh, either the heart rate along the 24 hours and the blood and the blood pressure. It's uh, like a, a ABPM, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So uh, participants will be more uh, willing uh, uh, to be monitored for five days. What we found, firstly, we found that Within the first 48 hours post-vaccination, we find significant changes in nearly all 13 vitals compared to baseline. We have the baseline of each participant, just to remind you. But those changes faded or actually decreased back to baseline 48 hours. So this is one of the first objective evaluation of the safety of the vaccine. What was more surprisingly, is when we looked at the reported symptoms as requested by the WHO or the FDA for the uh, um, fatigue, headaches, muscle pain, etc., we find that those uh, um, rate of side effects were higher in the, sec in the second day and, and start decrease after the third one, pretty much in line with the current literature either from the randomized clinical trial of the population-based study. But to a surprising point was that we found some physiological changes even in the asymptomatic group. As you can see here, we divided to the analysis for the daytime and for the nighttime. You can see here the skin temperature and the heart rate. And this is the first day, the second day, so in the second day, for example, if we are looking on skin temperature, it was pretty similar between those that reported it with a fever to those that report no fever. So this is, if we are looking the safety side of the reported New England and other study came later on, there might be not reflect accurately the physiological changes following the vaccine. And even more importantly, it's pretty hard to report during the night, as I mentioned, right? People don't, we cannot ask our participants to wake up during the night, put you in the alarm for 2 a.m. and, and the, for the temperature, right? And maybe the nighttime, we know the nighttime have dramatic effect on our health, like the a, a dipping in, in blood pressure, people that, it's, it's important, what is your blood pressure? It's more important to have dipping during the night have similar picture for symptomatic and unsymptomatic. And we found the same in heart rate, in saturation, in, in respiratory rate, and in, in more advanced uh, um, marker, including the cardiac output and the respiratory rate. And we have several conclusions from this study, from this proof of, of concept study. First of all, it's 
maybe the most important, it's another proof of the safety of the vaccine. We need to convince as a scientist in, in the School of Public Health, we want more people to get vaccinated. And we, here we have another evaluation of the safety of the vaccine. It's important to convince and, and to remove those concerns about the safety. People less care about the efficacy. If it's gonna be 95 or 92 or even 85, people are not gonna get vaccinated if the side effect will be too adverse. So if we have another proof, objective and continuously for the safety, it's important. Second, we find that uh, uh, most or nearly all uh, 13 vitals uh, uh, were a change in the symptomatic, but also in the asymptomatic. Um, as I mentioned, the concerns of get vaccinated might be uh, removed at some part. And maybe it's time in 2022 to change the regulation, either in the FDA, the CMARC, or the WHO, to move forward for objective, continuous evaluation that have been used in many of us. Enjoy your lunch. Uh, questions, I think, uh, are there any questions? I have a comment, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's, uh, it's, I think it's uh, important to apply all these uh, very sensitive uh, and objective, but very sensitive uh, tools. But sometimes uh, if things are f uh, physiological and you, you use a, a too sensitive tool, maybe it's uh, a bit, uh, you know, you have to think about this, but it's important to, to use uh, more better, please. So, so thank you for asking. And I actually forgot to mention that. Um, this is just a snapshot of a large cohort that run by uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Minian Erez Shmueli that repeat those results with this more simple smartwatch by, by Fitbit following 3,000 participants with 4,000 doses of, of vaccine and similar results are found. So we have the technology. It doesn't necessarily have to be highly sensitive. It can be used in a more simple way, but the objective versus subjective might be too different. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all the speakers and thank you for uh, being, to, being here and uh, go to lunch.